Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. This for the week of January 11th to 17th, 2021. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host Jean Deville. Before getting started, we would like to send a special thanks to our good friends at GoTikonauts and SpaceWatch.Global, two excellent sources of space industry news. This week, we bring you updates on CASC's pr uh, propulsion technology from this week, as well as an, uh, an announcement by the U.S. government of the addition of several Chinese companies to an entity's list. But first, some news from iSpace on a planned IPO. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. The first piece of news from this week comes from commercial launch startup iSpace. The company has announced plans to IPO on Shanghai's Starboard or Kechuangban, which is a sort of Chinese version of the Nasdaq exchange. So to give a little bit of context first on the Kechuangban, uh, so the, the Kechuang bomb, which is, uh, again, it's a sort of Chinese uh, stock market that is aimed towards higher growth, higher risk companies. It was opened a couple of years ago, and it is uh, China's most recent attempt at creating capital markets that are a little bit less um, stringent and, and a little bit less bureaucratic. So basically, the traditional Chinese stock exchanges, they have rather strict listing regulations for things like profitability or for just um, for companies registered capital, this type of thing. And so the, the Star Board, uh, which again opened in 2019, has been an effort to allow earlier stage companies to list their shares, giving early stage investors an exit, and also uh, giving earlier stage companies access to more capital. And up to now, we've seen a couple of different space companies list on the, the Shanghai Star Board. So the, the most uh, notable that I can think of would have been PiSat, which is a sort of Earth observation data analytics company. Um, but again, this week we have seen news that iSpace, which is one of China's leading commercial launch companies, is planning to list on the, the Starboard as well. Uh, the, the news, it was a very brief, uh, very brief news article. It was basically just from the official Starboard news saying that iSpace plans to list, did not give a date, did not give a market capitalization. But nonetheless, um, it's a really noteworthy, I think, uh, piece of uh, noteworthy development that iSpace plans to list. Um, noteworthy for a couple of reasons. So first, iSpace is still really early stage. I mean, the company plans to to launch their, well, they, they have already, been, they were the first Chinese uh, commercial launch company to reach orbit with their Hyperbola 1 rocket in mid-2019, I believe. Um, and this year, they plan to launch their, their Hyperbola 2 rocket, um, but still, they are very early stage. They are quite far from profitability. They're, they're probably not even getting consistent revenues right now because they're, they're not launching at the moment. Um, so the, the fact that such an early stage space company is is choosing to IPO, I, I think, is quite um, it's quite noteworthy. I think it's also um, it's it's important because it it may give early stage investors an opportunity to to get out if they want to. Now, presumably, if you're an early stage investor in iSpace at this point, you would not want to to get out of of uh, of your investment because they're still like really early stage company. But um, one of the important kind of topics that we, we have talked about over the course of the last couple of years is with lots of money coming into the space industry, that there's going to need to be a way for this money to exit and, and for these investors to get a return on their investment. We, we can't just keep having larger rounds of funding at larger valuations, but with no real revenue or profitability or exit strategy. And so this potential listing on the starboard would, uh, again, it would, might allow early stage investors uh, an, an exit. Um, one other piece of, of information that was um, that was mentioned in, in the uh, in the press release was the fact that the the sort of financial advisors for this transaction are going to be Citic Securities and Tianfeng Securities. Uh, and Citic, of course, is um, a major uh, state-owned investment firm. They they own uh, half of AsiaSat, which is a Hong Kong-based satellite operator. Um, and they they're certainly they're they're a very 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 powerful financial institution in China. So. Some pretty big news with iSpace planning their um, their IPO on the Starboard. And uh, John, anything uh, anything from your side on, on the iSpace announcement? Yeah, um, I, I think this is a really interesting piece of news that you're bringing up because I, I don't think you propagated too much on on social media, at least the English social speaking world of the of social media. And I I am not surprised that it would be the first launch company to potentially IPO this year or next year. Or I mean, the date wasn't announced, but um, iSpace is a 
company, uh, which I, I, I mean, I follow their social me media very closely, and they've been making a lot of progress over the past months. And they, what's very nice with iSpace is they publish very, very regularly um, updates and pictures and cool videos of what they're doing on social media. And so the last thing we got off WeChat was um, basically uh, the completion of the test that they did with struts, which, which is the the shock absorption mechanism that typically you would find in uh, landing legs of reusable rockets. And that's that's really essential because they're working, you know, on the Hyperbola 2 and on the um, well, potentially doing first hops of the Hyperbola 2 rocket uh, in 2021. And just back to IPOs, um, I think that we're seeing a lot of, while still being very early stage, we, we're seeing increasing a lot of these CapEx heavy um, um, uh, space companies, commercial space companies, are really growing in maturity, and and I would not be surprised if there was um, quite soon a, a first wave of these capex heavy companies that would um, enter the starboard. So there's there's iSpace that you've you've mentioned, and there's also uh, like typically in December 2020, so less than a month ago, we had um, um, Ch uh, Changwang Satellite, also known as Charming Globe, that uh, raised a huge amount of funding, and they called it a pre-IPO round. So probably announcing mm. uh, what their next move in terms of raising money would be. And we also had a couple other companies in 2020 raise record amounts of, of, of money, and that includes iSpace, obviously, but also uh, LandSpace. We also had Galactic Energy, um, Galaxy Space, Comsets. We have all these companies that potentially could be future candidates um, for, for the Starboard. And so I think very interesting times and looking forward to see this, the, the Starboard in Shanghai, you know, get a more of a space color than what it is um, right now. And just a couple of, uh, couple of really quick uh, points to, to, to round out here. And then I think you can take us into the, the announcement from Cask. Um, so, so two pieces of, of, well, I guess one piece of news this week that relates to this that, that is, I think, an interesting comparison. But, but first, um, I think the distinction between a company like iSpace or Charming Globe, as you brought up, or, or even a Galaxy Space, and a PiSat, which is already listed on, on the starboard. Um, so, you know, PiSat being a primarily software-based company, very low mm -hmm. CapEx, primarily OpEx, you know, basically it, it's, it's not this sort of heavy industry type of company. Um, and... And again, they had a successful IPO maybe a year, year and a half, well, about a year ago, I guess. Um, and and it's it's noteworthy, I think, that we're seeing these, as you said, these more kind of capex heavy companies moving into uh, into the starboard. The other piece of news that that wasn't really related to China this week, but that makes me think a little bit about about IPOs in the space industry in China, was the um, Arc Investment. So it's a sort of a financial investment firm in the it's a firm in the U.S. that has a bunch of different ETFs that are focused on different. Emerging technology industries, and their CEO uh, Catherine Wood, I think, is her name. She's quite famous. Very, um, some people consider her the next Warren Buffett. Some people consider her not particularly knowledgeable, and, and I'm probably somewhere in between. But they've been very famous for having a big Tesla stake for a lot of 2020 in several of their funds, and they've done extraordinarily well as a result. But this past week, Catherine Wood announced, or you know, uh, Ark announced, they're going to do a space ETF, and uh, the shares like Maxar and uh, and Virgin Galactic. That day they went up twenty something percent. I mean, it was huge, um, and I don't know to what extent that will be imitated in China. But I know that our our mutual friend Tian Yi was posting about Catherine Wood and Ark and their space ETF on WeChat. So definitely, people in China are talking about it. Um, but uh, yeah, so we'll see. But certainly, space is becoming a hotter topic. I think of investment over you know in both the West and China. And uh, that's just the most recent example. So, um, shall we discuss Cask and their, their their propulsion technology? Absolutely. So, first discussion today was a lot on commercial companies and and, and listed companies and potentially future companies that would IPO. Now, a little bit about the state-owned companies of China, which have been giving us quite a few up updates also over the past few days, uh, notably Cask and in terms of launch. So, I have three pieces of news to share here today. There's there's the first one, which is a an update from AALPT, also known as the Sixth Academy. The full name is the Academy of Aerospace Launch Propulsion Technology. It's uh, an academy of CASC, and uh, basically they published on their social media, and there's also a CCTV report on how they completed a 500-second uh, hot-fire test of the YF-77 um, engine, which is the um, liquid fuel, the Hydrolox engine that you have on the Long March 5. And so this was actually the fourth such test and they're actually planning to do four more. And these 500 second tests, they're actually reliability tests. 500 seconds 
is um, basically um, almost three or four times the amount the rocket would actually run normally when it's operational on a Long March 5 launch. And the idea is to just obviously to make it more reliable, especially in such a critical year in 2021 and 2022. The Long March 5B is notably uh, planning to send into space the different modules of the um, of the Chinese space station. So a lot of stuff on reliability. And actually, in the CCTV news, we saw also a short extract um, showing that the um, well ALPT had actually um, built a test bench specifically de dedicated to the um, turbo pumps of the YF-77. If you remember a couple of years ago, um, in 2017, the second launch of Long March 5 uh, failed because of this turbo pump. So they showed in this report that last year they had built a dedicated test bench just to increase the reliability and just to continuously study this turbo pump, uh, probably with the perspective of making sure that nothing goes wrong uh, for the uh, Chinese space station. So that's, that's the first launch update. The second one is also from ALPT, and this is progress they're making on their next generation Hydrolox, so liquid-fueled um, engine. And this engine would be um, would be extremely heavy lift. I don't think it has a name yet, uh, I although I think it's called YF. 20, 220, that's because it delivers um, a lot of thrust. So just a little background on this engine. It delivers 220 tons of thrust. That's, that's massive. That's three or four times the thrust that delivers uh, the YF-77 that's on the Long March 5. 220 tons, that puts it in the same class as, say, the, um, the Space Shuttle main engine, and that's the RS-25. This is typically the engine that you you saw. If you, I don't know if you watched the um, Green Run hot fire test um, uh, of SLS a couple of days ago, but that's the engines that you saw in that test uh, by NASA. And also, so these are the engines that potentially would be powering the second stage of the Long March 9 that's supposed to come in the 2030s. And it's also uh, worth noting that it's a stage combustion cycle. So this is much more sophisticated uh, stuff than say the YF-77, where it's an open generator cycle that's more simple, but um, you know less less efficient. And last point here on launch is um, this time from AASPT, which is the Chinese, I mean the the Chinese Academy of um, Aerospace Solid Propulsion Technology, also called the Fourth Academy of CASC. The AASPT revealed them. Well, this is not actually um, recent news. It dates back to December thirtieth. So a couple of weeks back, but we didn't report about it. And there were a few questions in the YouTube um, um, comment section. So I decided also to, to throw it in here. Um, basically, ASPT, they proceeded um, to a test firing of one of the, well, the largest uh, segmented solid rocket motor uh, in, in, in Chinese history so far. So it's this rocket motor is absolutely massive in terms of thrust, but also in terms of diameter and also just in terms of the length that it was fired. So just to give a few figures here, uh, um, the the thrust provided is 260 tons. So that's really that's, that's gigantic. Um, and it ran for 130 seconds. And this um, massive rocket engine, we don't know what it will be used for, but probably one of the future uh, super heavy lift launch vehicles of China. Don't have much more information on which what that will be. Um, but but I think it's worth noting also that historically, China has been very good in making solid rocket engines. Historically, not actually for launch vehicles, but for missile technology. But there's this new trend over the past 10 years of converting solid rocket engines uh, for missiles into actually launch vehicles for, for satellites. And that's what we've seen with the Kwaijo series of X-Space. It's also the case for Long March 11 of the of CASC. And now we're seeing a potentially ASPT building a dedicated solid rocket um, engine for launch vehicles. So I think it's also a shift to see that, um, well, solid rocket, solid fueled launch vehicles are getting more and more traction potentially in the in the family of um, Chinese launch vehicles, which is still very um, liquid fueled orientated. Um, yeah, I mean, any thoughts on that, Blaine? Or yeah, I mean, I think that just the um... So definitely very helpful breakdown of, of some some very kind of rocketry specific information. And I think from my perspective, really the, the big takeaway is just the what this implies about kind of the size and diversity of China's space industrial base more generally. So if you think about the the number of people in Xi'an right now working on, on rockets, I mean, it, it, it is thousands of people, I suppose. And that's just one city 
uh, which is not even, you know, the, 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 it's not even close to the largest aerospace and space city in China. I mean, probably it would still be top six, but, but Beijing far and away. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing when you think about just the, the infrastructure that is already in place, the number of scientists, the number of, of organizations. And I mean, that's, that's both a strength and, and a weakness, I suppose, when you look at how quickly organizations and, and I guess space programs are evolving now. I mean, when you look at, uh, like, yes, China's space industry has evolved very, very, very quickly over the last, say, 40 years. But I would argue that SpaceX probably has evolved more quickly than China, uh, if you consider, like, the amount being spent and the amount of time they're taking and all these things. And um, having these very big sort of administrative structures in place, again, it, it, it's, a, it's I think it's a, it's a strength in the sense that it gives China a lot of resources to do interesting things. But it can also be a weakness in the sense that it may make them a little bit um, uh, less nimble, perhaps, than might otherwise be the case. Um, but either way, some some pretty cool updates coming from Cask, and definitely um, something to to keep an eye on moving forward. Um, shall we go towards our, our our favorite topic, which is just the deteriorating uh, the deteriorating relationship between my home country and my adopted home country, and and just sort of the. Uh, show that that has become. I don't know if I can use that phrase on YouTube, but if not, we'll have to bleep it out and, and, and that's all fine. But great. Probably. And definitely a recurring topic over the past months. Um, so uh, the U.S. added nine companies to a blacklist um, just, just a couple days ago on the 14th of January. And these nine companies included COMAX, so Commercial Aircraft of China, the basically the, the state-owned company that's carrying most of China's commercial aircraft programs. We also have uh, CNAH, which is the parent company of Air China, the the airline. And we also have, interestingly, a Xiaomi as well as other companies. So Xiaomi being the the company that's making phones and also a lot of smart home devices. Um, and so one thing that's to note about this blacklist is this blacklist is DOD, Department of Defense uh, specific. It's quite different from the blacklist that we heard just a couple of weeks ago. You know, on the 23rd of December, we had uh, the U.S. put 102 or 103 companies on a on a blacklist. And this included a lot of aerospace companies from China, but also from Russia. And that, wa that was another blacklist. That was a blacklist from the Department of Commerce, uh, Bureau of Industry and Security. And so this that blacklist, the um, the MEU blacklist, the military end user uh, blacklist is is much more restrictive in terms of what it does. So what it, basically companies on that list, they will have restrictions. I mean, US, U.S. companies will have restrictions in terms of what they can sell to these companies on the MEU blacklist. But the blacklist I'm talking about today is actually much less re restrictive from the DOD. Um, basically, what it imposes is that all U.S. citizens and companies will have to divest assets they, that they would have in the nine companies that were added to the blacklist a couple of days ago. So um, I don't think the impact is too big. Typically, COMAC, at least for now, won't have too much trouble um, buying um, you know, American components um, due to this this blacklist. And I think the impact is also very minimal in the sense that COMAC and Air China and actually a lot of the companies that are on this list are actually state-owned companies. So already, I mean, the shareholders are, are Chinese people and not U.S. companies or ent entities. Um, it might be a little bit different, though, for Xiaomi. Xiaomi is being a tech company that's listed in New York and as well as in Hong Kong. And if you look a little bit at their share prices over the past uh, couple days, and especially on the January 14th, the day of the announcement, there was a huge two digit drop. So definitely affecting the company and potentially, I think, would could mean uh, that the company would have to delist um, if, if this goes on. Although I don't know how this would be impacted by the upcoming um, also Biden administration policy. And the last point I just want to add before handing it over to you, uh, Blaine, is that we've also seen China grow in increasingly infuriated by this. Um, trade restriction and investment restriction policy uh, from the U.S. And uh, a couple of days ago, so on January the 9th at 2021, they released a new set of laws uh, that's uh, known as the Blocking st Statute, which is basically a series of legal mechanisms uh, to stop, basically to protect Chinese companies from, um, well, um, extraterritorial uh, trade restrictions. And typically, I think what they're aiming at is laws such as the ones in the blacklist that were published um, this year and also last year. So we don't know how this is going to be implemented. It's still a recent um, update here that we have from China. But um, yeah, we, we can see China 
you know, preparing some arms as well to to um, to protect their Chinese companies. And certainly the inclusion of, of, of Xiaomi on this list is, as you said, I mean, that, that's the one that really stands out uh, to me and not just because I'm a Xiaomi shareholder, which uh, is going to be something that I need to figure out between now oh, really? and November 11th. Yeah, that's been a, a nice, yeah. But um, digressing, um, it's an interesting precedent, including a consumer electronics company on this list. I mean, Xiaomi, unlike, say, Huawei or, or you know, even Comac, I, I would argue that what they're producing is, is less... Um, you know, hugely strategic at a, at a kind of national level. Um, but I think it, it's it's interesting because one thing that Xiaomi does do very well is, is uh, and we, we discussed this a little bit earlier, uh, but before this, this episode was, um, you know, IoT devices for, for smart home kind of things. And and thinking back, so I, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago. He's uh, recently uh, relocated. He's an American citizen, recently relocated back to the U.S., uh, working for a big tech company and and would would likely be considered um, you know top ten percent of, of of income earners in the U S. and was saying that everyone in, in his sort of circle of friends is buying smart home devices this year, um, and and mostly it would be uh, implicitly not Xiaomi I would think if you are if you are kind of um, what sort of let's say a yuppie in the U S. but there's a large percentage of people in the U S. who are not able to afford higher end uh, IoT, you know, smart home devices, but who may still want to have a, a smart home as it were. And for that type of a, of a market segment, I would imagine Xiaomi products would be quite appealing. And that could be in the sort of very medium to long-term concerning from a US government perspective. If we have like large portions of our, um, let's say more cost conscious electronics consumers having smart homes that are all outfitted with Xiaomi devices and allowing Xiaomi to listen in on, on, you know, on these smart homes. So, so, I mean, certainly it's, it's a, that, that was, that was one that stood out was the inclusion of Xiaomi. Um, a couple of other points I think that are, that are worth mentioning about Xiaomi, just, I guess, more, more related to space, less related to this particular, um, uh, this particular ruling. Um, so, I mean, Xiaomi has been pretty involved in, in the Chinese commercial space sector over the last few years. So Lei Jun, who is the, the CEO and, and the founder of Xiaomi, um, he, I guess in about mid-2020, uh, at the time of the, the National People's Congress, I believe, um, he published some kind of recommendations for reform in the in the space and the commercial space and the satellite internet sector. Um, this around the time that the NDRC had published their new infrastructures list and included satellite internet. And, and Lei Jun, I mean, he, he has a very interesting background as, as Xiaomi's CEO in the sense that he kind of he moved to Beijing in the 90s as kind of a, a wonder kid and was one of the leading executives at a company called Kingsoft, which was a sort of like the Chinese version of Microsoft. They then IPO'd and they were one of the first Chinese tech companies to IPO. The founding member or the founding team became quite rich. They joined among them and they became kind of the first generation of, of venture capitalists in, in, in China. This is in Beijing in sort of the early 2000s. And so Lei Jun has really, um, he's kind of grown up it, it, around this group in Beijing as, as kind of a, a wonder kid, always punching above his weight, um, and now seems to really be pushing for, for reform in, in the space industry. And, and Galaxy Space, the, the commercial constellation company, a lot of their funding seems to have come from Shunwei Capital, which is the, the VC of, of Lei Jun. Um, Lei Jun is noteworthily on the company's Chinese website under the company leadership. Um, so yeah, I mean, certainly I, I think Xiaomi is, um, it's an increasingly important company, it, it seems like. They have increasingly large ambitions. Um, I, I would argue personally, and this is very much just my personal opinion, that Lei Jun is probably the closest thing that China has right now to an Elon Musk, um, which is not to say that he's anywhere close to an Elon Musk in terms of, of just sort of what he's trying to do, but but. Um, yeah, just in terms of somebody who's able to really influence politicians to some extent, and, but who is still very much kind of rooted in the private sector. Um, so yeah, certainly a, a company to watch moving forward. And um, something I need to think about is how to how to dispose of that that shareholding of Xiaomi before November 11th. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting to see how a number of data is becoming more sensitive in general. Um, so there, there's this um, blacklisting of Xiaomi um, but you know there was there was the um, the TikTok crisis uh, last year, and I don't think it's totally over uh, this year. And and DJI was also put on a blacklist uh, by the U.S. because typically, well, drones are recording a lot of, of video all around the country, and, and DJI mm. maybe has eighty or ninety percent of that market. So 
Um, it will be interesting to see how these this impacts these companies. And um, yeah, I hope you don't have any shares in in DJI or in in, in TikTok. Well, thankfully, I guess DJI is uh, is still private. TikTok, well, yeah, should be okay. I have some Oracle, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so uh, that being the case, I think uh, I think we are good to go. That has been uh, this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. This for the week of. January 11th to 17th, a short reminder that if you have not checked it out yet, our interview with Dong Lu from ComSat is uh, is available on YouTube and on podcast uh, hosting platforms everywhere. Uh, it is about a one hour discussion on satellite manufacturing in China and the rapidly evolving uh, space industrial base in, uh, in this uh, world's probably second largest space industry. So Thank you very much for listening, and uh, we welcome uh, comments, follows, likes, shares, and any other social media activity. We're uh, this is uh, so yeah. This is Blaine Curcio, joined as always by Sean Deville, and uh, we will see you next week on the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.